Now, you briefly touched on how in that little Zan gig, uh, they had Triple One as one of the support acts. And correct me if I got the dates wrong, but I think around 2018 is when you started management for Triple One. Now, first of all, was that the first group uh, that you did artist management for? And also, how did that role come about for you? Yeah, um, basically what happened was around 2018, long story short, like I got turned down from two jobs that I was like pretty confident I was gonna get in the journalism space. So one was in Berlin and one was in Melbourne and I got turned down from both. So basically after that, I was like, fuck this, I'm sick of this. <laughs> Don't wanna do it anymore, chucking a hissy fit, doing whatever. So um, I've said this before in a lot of interviews, like in music especially, it's like when you're not making enough money from one lane, you, you got to pivot. You always got to pivot because if COVID's shown us anything, like, you know, people in the live sector, it's like, you know, how devastating COVID was. I really feel like it's really important to have multiple streams of income, especially in an industry where jobs aren't so stable. You know what I mean? So I think that's kind of when I really started looking into doing something different. And, you know, like um, management had not really crossed my mind but I was a massive, massive fan of Triple One. So like, like I said, I, I came from a background of like, you know, hardcore, emo, punk rock, metal. So when someone like Triple One comes along and you know, obviously they were very heavily influenced by Suicide Boys in the early days. Um, I understood it, you know what I mean? It really spoke to me on, on, on both the alternative side and the hip hop side. Um, so I premiered a couple of their songs. Um, I was just kind of helping him out here and there just how to send emails, how to, you know, negotiate show fees. This is all stuff I just learned from just being in, in the industry or, or whatever you want to say. So um, basically, yeah, I, I, I noticed that I was spending more and more time kind of just helping Triple One out. And then, yeah, one day a mate of mine was just like, why don't you just try management? And I was like, yeah, I mean, can't hurt, you know what I mean? So <laughs> I literally just, um, yeah, I called up the, at that point I was really only speak, speaking to Marty. Um, because I'd only really met Mar I met Marty at the one day Sundays parties, like the, the ones I was talking about before. So me and him knew each other from just partying or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, I called him up and I was like, Hey boys, we should have a meeting. And they're like, yeah, sweet. Met up at a milkshake shop. Ha we, we ordered five milkshakes. So weird. Like, I don't know. I don't know why. Like we ordered five milkshakes. Um, and I said to him on the first day, I said, you know, I'm not going to promise you. I'm not going to sit here and promise you that. I'm going to make you guys famous, but I'm going to promise you that I'm going to go hard and fill in the gaps where you guys need and add value where you guys need. And I think that's what a good manager does. You know, we don't make false promises. We just, we, we add value where we can, you know what I mean? We know when, to, we, we know when to lean in and when to back off. So yeah, so we just had a trial basis from the very start. Um, and in those early days, man, it was, it was rough because you got to remember back then, um, the underground was not getting any attention really on the industry side. You know, they were doing big numbers on YouTube, but not really big numbers streaming. Um, no one wanted to book them for shows, which is crazy to say now, because it's only four years later. And, you know, it seems like there's an Ozrap act on every festival, like pretty high up. And, you know, but this was, this was way before then, you know what I mean? So the promoter, like I knew a lot of promoters, a lot of booking agents, a lot of stuff, people here and there. Um, no one wanted a bar of it. You know, no one wanted a bar of it. Like it was, it was fucking ridiculous, you know? And obviously that just made me more, de more determined to, you know, really break him. And then uh, one of my old friends who actually a and um, one of the One Day Records, he was head of a and at Sony Records. So he took an interest in Triple One. We started having conversations with him. Um, eventually we cut a distribution deal with The Orchard, which is the subsidiary of Sony. And that's when our shit started getting played on the, getting played on the Jays. And that's when, you know, that I really feel like Triple One getting signed, the first ones from that wave to get signed, that's what really put the whole industry on notice about what was happening underneath. And when I, and, and, and that was, you know, from Chillin' It, Wombat, Shadow, um, Mitchos, uh, Nerve, all those guys. I feel like after Triple One signed that deal and we started getting sp spun on the Jays, that's when everyone started being like, what's this, what's this, what's this? And obviously now like it's, it's just blown up. So 
yeah, that was kind of like my first foray into management. And it was a really good experience for me because like, yeah, like I said, we had to fight for everything, you know? We were getting love from fans in Germany, Poland, Russia, the US, who were getting triple one tattoos and then pulling 10 people to it. We were pulling 10 people to a show in Sydney. And we're like, you know, and that was the real, that was the real, um, that was the real struggle for me. You know, I was saying we have streams overseas, um, but how do we connect those streams overseas into paying fans in Australia? And I feel like the missing link in there was, you know, getting promoters on board, getting booking agents on board. So we'll get put in front of bigger audiences, playing headline shows, playing festivals, you know, getting radio play to expand our fan base. And then, yeah, the rest is history, man. But yeah, we had to fight for everything in those early days. And yeah, it was, it was a very different time, but I'm, I'm glad it happened. Yeah. Now, another artist that you've managed uh, is Nerve. Um, again, same sort of question. How did you guys link in? And then how did you become his manager? Yeah, so with Nerve, um, we actually took him on a national Triple One tour, which was 2019. We took him to all six shows, but I knew him before that just through 50-50, fully gassed. Obviously, the ciphers and everything that was happening back then, he was really causing creating a name for himself because he was really, you know, him and Wombat were going hard on the grime ciphers. They were swimming up there with ADOT and Fracture and Dime and, and all that. And they were holding their ground. And I was really impressed, you know. Um, so I interviewed him a couple of times as well, supported his art wherever. And this would have been the end of 2019. Um, he actually called me and, and by this point, we were on a friendly basis, you know, um, me and Nerve, we just chat about whatever. And he called me and he said, hey, what are you doing this New Year's? And I said, nothing. And he said, do you want to come down to Force Festival? Because, you know, we're playing and it'd be, it'd be cool to hang out. And I said, yeah, for sure. So I went down to Melbourne. Uh, we got the bus. We were driving down to Lawn. On the way down to Lawn, Bushfires Festival canceled. Um, so we went back to Melbourne um, and we went to a weird hipster New Year's Eve party that was playing techno music and... It was just weird and it, it was New Year's and then Carl Golly was actually the one that hit me up and said, this was like 3 a.m. in like a techno party and Carl Golly's like, hey man, like have you ever thought about managing Nerve? You should give it a crack. And I was like, yeah, can we not talk about this now? Like I'm actually on holidays. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? We're in a techno party and it's really loud and whatever. Um, so yeah, like a couple of days later, I went back to Sydney, called Nerve and I said, hey, Carl said this to me on New Year's Eve, but I don't know if he was just drunk or whatever. Uh, but Nerve was like, yeah, fuck, let's do it. So yeah, from the start of 2020, I've just been managing Nerve and obviously it hasn't been the easiest run because of, um, I feel like we've never really been able to capitalize that hard on his momentum because we just had two years of COVID and he's played a couple of shows here and there. He did half of his tour, but then the other half got canned because of COVID. And then, but this year we're really going hard with Nerve. Um, you know, he's a super switched on artist. Obviously, I think it goes without saying, he, he could spit bars from now until next Sunday if he wanted to. Um, you know, really determined, knows what he wants, charismatic. He's, he's a whole package. He's, he's a great artist to work with, you know? So yeah, this year, um, you know, he's been on tour with Bliss Nesso. He's been on tour with DZ Death Rays. He's about to do the tour with H. He's got a bunch of new music to drop. So now I feel like really this year is when it's, it's you know, COVID's hopefully, you know, touch wood is, is gone forever. So we're just really going hard this year. But yeah, it's been awesome to manage him. And, you know, not only is a friend, but obviously an artist I really believe in, you know? Now, so correct me if I'm wrong, you're still managing Nerve, but you're not still managing Triple One? Yeah. And then are those two artists the only artists that you have had managerials for or there's other artists that you've done that for as well? Yeah, I literally just started managing Speed. Like that, it's not hip hop at all, so we're not going to talk about it for that long, but <laughs> it's weird because they're a hardcore band, but they haven't crossed over in the hip hop space, you know, like Howie loves them. Um, they played a show with Posse Shot um, down in Melbourne. They played a show with Nerve in Sydney. I think it's just because they wear sportswear and stuff and they're just like jacked Asian dudes like that hip hop people can resonate with them, you know? So yeah, it's awesome to see that, you know, a hardcore band, especially an Asian hardcore band is resonating and having crossover in the hip hop space. But yeah, I've just started um, co-managing them last week and they're blowing up, you know? We fucking beat Chris Brown on the ARIA charts by 27 units, you know what I mean? Like that's... Like, how does a bedroom operation for a hardcore band beat Chris Brown? I don't know, but it happened. So, yeah, it's been it's been really good to um, work with them and work on something outside of hip-hop, to be honest. Like, I feel like hip-hop, sometimes we can get really um, 
uh, tunnel vision with, 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 with what we're listening to and what we're doing. So it's really good for me to kind of, you know, get someone outside of that sphere and, and, and be a more well-rounded manager or well-rounded A&R, yeah. The, the, the last oh, yeah.